Our sermon lesson this morning is from Paul's epistle or Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This text will serve as the basis for our sermon this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry that of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when everyone, anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the Word of God. Imagine standing before Mount Everest and contemplating making that climb. It's maybe the feeling that you get contemplating that text that we just read. There's a lot going on there. And maybe similar to a climb of Mount Everest, the text, the sermon lesson that we just read, it's a little challenging to understand. At the same time, it's also thrilling. It's a little dangerous. We'll unpack why. But it's also beautiful because it's glorious. Just like a mountaintop view from Everest. Can you imagine how glorious that would be? The feeling of making it to the top. Yeah, it's no secret. The, the sermon lesson that I just read, it's a lot to wrap your mind around. And, and that's why I think it makes sense that Bible commentators have, have often called what we just read, Paul's sermon there, the Mount Everest of Paul's sermons. It's because it's challenging to understand. You, you have to have some maybe background knowledge because what Paul does is offer up some divinely inspired commentary about the Old Testament lesson we just read from Exodus. There, what happened was Moses actually already got the Ten Commandments. He had them in his hand, but then he came down from Mount Sinai and he saw Israel worshiping a golden calf. So Moses slams the tablets down and in our lesson, he has to go back up the mountain as a way to, to reconcile that relationship with God. He, he gets the commandments again and he comes back down and this time he's full of glory, having seen the Lord himself. And that causes fear among Israel. And then Paul says, but the, that glory faded. That glory faded because what, what Moses' ministry was about it's about the law. And the law, it, it's good, it, it's glorious, but compared to the ministry of the Spirit, well, it has no glory comparative. This text, maybe like a mountain climb, it, it's challenging to understand. It's, it's also thrilling because 
Well, you heard all the ups and downs. You heard all the contrasts in there, didn't you? I already hinted at one. It's the comparison between Paul's ministry of the gospel and Moses's ministry of the law. A comparison between the gospel, which proclaims to you that Jesus didn't fail, but it is finished. You are justified before God. And well, on the other hand, the law, which says, this is what you should do. And this is where you failed to do what you should do. You read the comparison. You have the law, the message of Moses, which actually makes people dull. And then you have the message of the gospel that makes people bold. You have that which kills and condemns, and you have that which gives life and liberation, freedom. Here's a huge theme. You have that which, well, the glory passes away. It's transitory. And then you have the glory that lasts, that endures. This text, it, it's thrilling. It's, it's maybe hard to understand. But ultimately, this text, well, it's also dangerous. We won't get into this much today, but you know why this text is dangerous? It's because the reason Paul wrote it, he's practicing this theological art called polemics or defense, where you go against someone who's, who's critically knocking the faith. You see, there was these, these people in Corinth who had glowing faces. Paul called them super apostles because that's what they thought they were. And they said, hey, Paul's ministry of this gospel doesn't really look glorious, does it? Because it's not the real thing. And they pushed this, this ministry of the law that said, this is what you need to do if you want to be saved, if you want a right relationship with God. And so the reason Paul wrote this is because he's throwing down, he's coming after them. Dangerous text, but ultimately it's a glorious text. Because in it, what God reveals to all of you is how you have glory. You have glory because what, what Christ did is uncovered the veil that, that shields that. And now we, with unveiled faces, can look at our Savior and receive from him ever-increasing glory as we become like him. Yeah, maybe like an ascent to Mount Everest, this text, it, it's challenging, it's dangerous, it's thrilling, but there's one more thing I didn't mention. It's also transformative. You know, you'd be a changed person if you ever made it to the top of Mount Everest, and not just because you'd have bragging rights, but because of, of what you went through and, and what you saw, it would, it would transform you, it would, it would change you. And ultimately, that's what this sermon from Paul gets at, and, and that's what this sermon today is going to do. We could talk all about those other aspects, but what I want to do today is, is cut right to the top of the mountain and just stand there and, and be transformed, because ultimately, that's what the Holy Spirit answers with this sermon. How is it? How is it that a person is spiritually changed, transformed, transfigured? So that's the question that we're going to answer. And I said I'm, I'm going to make it simple this morning because there is a lot going on in this text. I'm actually just going to give you the answer right away. Sometimes when we bring up questions in a sermon, I might not give the answer right away to maybe create a little tension, maybe to get us to dive deeper into God's word. No, this morning, I'm just going to give it to you right away. How are you spiritually transformed? This is it. You and your spirit-fueled transformation, it's accomplished not by your implementation of God's law, but only by your contemplation. Only your contemplation of God's glorious gospel. That's it. How are you personally, spiritually changed? It's not by your implementation, how well you do or don't do God's law. It's only by your contemplation of God's glorious gospel. So we're gonna ask some questions to break that down a little more. The first one's this, 
What is spiritual transformation? The second one we'll look through as we walk through this is, is who, who needs it? Who is, is personal spiritual transformation for? And finally, if it's, if it's not by the law, well, how does spiritual transformation happen? What does that practically look like in your life? We're going to look at those three questions. Let's start with the first one. What is spiritual transformation? Well, verses 17 and 18 of our text, they answered the who, the what, and the where of spiritual transformation. We read it before. Paul said, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. What is spiritual transformation? Kind of already given it away, right? Paul says it is a spirit-fueled transformation. It is the Holy Spirit who converts hearts. It's the Holy Spirit who liberates you and frees you from sin, from guilt, from shame, and ultimately from death. It's the Holy Spirit who not only converts you, liberates you, but it's the Holy Spirit who transforms your heart and your life. That's the who, maybe the where. Where does spiritual transformation take place? Well, one way to answer that is to think about where does the Holy Spirit live or work? It's in, inside of you. It's in your heart. Another way to think about that is to ask, how did the transfiguration or the transformation of Jesus take place? Well, that too, that, that was a transformation from the inside out. You think about that. Jesus, who was true God and true man, on the Mount of Transfiguration, what was inside of him, it came out. Bible commentator Frederick Bruner said this, what Jesus was within was once made visible without. That which God was from all eternity, true God and true man, that which he, he, he concealed for the most part during his time on this earth, it came bursting out on the Mount of Transfiguration and all of his glory. That's why Peter looked and he saw the goodness, the grace, the power of God. And he said, I want to be here. I want to stay with that. What I'm trying to say plainly about transfiguration a poet, Malcolm Geet, said beautifully. He said, the love that dances at the heart of all things shone out on the face of Jesus. The love that dances at the heart of all things shone out on the face of Jesus. Love shining from the inside out. God, who is love there in the flesh, also glorified his unconditional love emanating out for all to see. That's where spiritual transformation takes place. So maybe the last part is actually, what is it? Well, it is spirit-fueled transformation from the inside out. The spirit working inside of you to make you more like Christ. To make Christ's love, Christ's love that dances at the center of all things, shine not just on Jesus, but shine out from you as well. You experience more of his glory. You show more of his glory, more of his hope, more of his peace, more of his joy, more of his freedom. All of that, that is spiritual transformation. Which kind of leads us to our second question is who is this for? kind of wrestled with whether or not I should include this question this week. Because you hear about what spiritual transformation is, that it's the Holy Spirit fueling or working inside of you for inside out transformation to make you more like Christ. And I kind of thought it's obvious, right? Like, who wouldn't want that? Like, who wouldn't want more of Christ? Who wouldn't want to experience more of his gifts, more of his glory? Of course, this is for everyone. We, we don't need to talk about who's it for. But then I was just reminded about how powerful the veil of the law and, and everything that goes with it is in our lives. 
pastor said there's, there's pretty much three ways that, that people react or have an attitude towards the law. And all three of those groups of people, if you will, they'll be listening to your sermon. Who, who needs spiritual transformation? There's really three groups of people that it's for. It's, it's first, it's, it's for people who do not want to be transformed. Second, it's for people who think they're already completely transformed. And three, it's for people who do not think they can be spiritually transformed. It's for people who think, I I don't need to be spiritually transformed. I don't want to be spiritually transformed. For people who are self-assured, self-confident. And while you might say, oh, that's, that's a really good thing, well, it's that mixed with this apathy or this, this just don't care about, well, what Christ offers, the, the transformation of, of more that God gives to you. What does this first group of people sound like? Well, they say things like, just love yourself for who you are. You just do you. Don't listen to anybody who tells you to change. You might think, well, what's wrong with that? Listen, it's, it's that mixed with an embrace of the fact that they're fallen. It's, it's that mixed with the fact that they just don't care that they're broken and, and there's someone who offers healing. We might compare this first group of people to, to someone drowning in a pool who, who doesn't care to be saved, but instead makes a splash and says, at least I'm making a splash. Everyone just look at me. That's the first group. There's, there's people who just don't want to be changed, transformed. Second group, it's people who think they are already completely transformed. These are the real Christians. So they think. It's the people who, who aren't so much Christ followers as they are rule followers. It's people who are very, very proud of their, their willpower, who, who will talk very openly about their spiritual disciplines and, and how good they are at keeping rules. These are people who, who trot out a lot of Bible sayings, but they use them not to proclaim the gospel that saves them, but to instead proclaim do-betterisms. What do these people look like? People who, who think they're already completely spiritually transformed? Well, continuing the analogy, it, it's, it's people drowning in a pool who, who are rather proud of the fact that they're still kicking, they're still paddling, and they might even look over at the person next to them who's also just struggling to stay afloat, and they shout at them, swim harder, paddle faster. There's two groups of people, and then a third. It's people who don't want to be spiritually transformed. It's people who already think they are. And the third group, it's people who do not think that they can be spiritually transformed. They know where they stand. They know where they stand before their maker, and they know where they stand before their, their God's laws. They're honest. They've broken all of them. They know that. They know that they're guilty. And so if we're going to compare this group, they're people who are drowning and they're just ready to give up and go under because all of the guilt and all of the shame, it's suffocating. Three groups of people for whom there is spiritual transformation, that, that this is for. And maybe now you're seeing why we needed to talk about it because we're all of these people. Okay, maybe not all of them at the same time, but, but maybe you oscillate between all of them on any given day or any given season in life. You, you've, you've been in one of those three groups. They're different. They're different attitudes. They're different 
set of beliefs. And yet, you know what's the same about all of them? They're all drowning. This is what Paul is getting at when he says, but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. What, people is, what Paul is saying here is that people's attitudes towards those law, those three different groups, their attitudes towards the law, what it does is it spiritually impairs them. It spiritually blinds them because it's like a veil is over their hearts. It doesn't matter if you're in the first group and you ignore the fact that God has laws. You're still blind. You're still drowning. It doesn't matter if you're in the second group and you think that you have completely been spiritually transformed and you keep all of God's laws. No, all have sinned and and fallen short of God's glory. It doesn't matter if you're in the third group and you just don't think you can be spiritually transformed because the law just crushes you. No, there is a God who gives hope. And Paul says, whichever one of those groups you're in, you're living spiritually, can I say this in a sermon? Stupid, blind. Your heart is is veiled. Your spirit-fueled transformation, your personal spiritual transformation, it's, it's not brought about, it's not accomplished by how well you implement, how well you do or don't do God's laws. I said I was gonna make it simple, so... To what can we compare this? Did any of you see the video a few years ago that came out of a horse, a Canadian horse in the wilderness that was, that was walking along? And it's, it's funny to compare a horse to people, but it was, it was pretty self-absorbed in what it was doing, eating grass, maybe counted in the first group. And, and so it fell in a mud pit and it got stuck in the mud pit and just like maybe that second group, it, it thought it could get out. It, it tried to run out and it sank even lower. It even tried to like jump out at one point, but the weight took it even lower into the mud. And this horse was stuck there. There's no way that it could get out. And so you just watch as it, it just kind of, third group gives up and sinks lower and lower. But there's right a video of this. And so you know that, that someone was there watching it and this couple who took the video, they came to help the horse. And at first, the horse was mad about this. Anyone would get near it, right? Chomp the teeth and even try to kick a front paw at them. After all, people always get defensive who are blind to, to God's law. But the couple persisted. They, they got in the mud and they got some straps and they wrapped it around the horse. And that's not comfortable. It's not made to be that way. That's not normally how horses are strapped up. And so it was painful, a little bit. You can tell it was uncomfortable when they they started to drag the horse out. And God's law always is a little painful, a little uncomfortable. But then it happened. Transformation. This disfigured horse who was covered by mud was then transfigured, if you will, and it was liberated. It was set free. And why? Because help came. Savior came, a Savior who, who wasn't afraid to get into the muck and the mud and, well, who transformed the situation, who transfigured this horse, well, from the inside out. My friends, do you want to be transformed? Another way to ask that is maybe like, is there anything in your life that you wish you could change? I hope by now that Moses has done his work. Moses, the law. And, and it's crushed you a bit to, to at least realize that you do need some change. We all need some transformation. But my prayer is this, that you, you don't stay focused on Moses, but you see what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. And that is that you have been transformed because your your transformation, it's accomplished not by how well you do laws. It is accomplished only by contemplating the Lord's glorious gospel. 
This is what Paul said. He said, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Look, Paul said there's, there's kind of three attitudes or reactions that humans have towards the law. You can ignore it, you can th think you fulfill it all by yourself, or you can be crushed and remain in despair by the law. But then he says, in Christ, it's all taken away. In Christ, that law, it's, it's taken away because look how Christ answers all of those attitudes towards the law. You might ignore the law and, and therefore you need Moses to crush you, the ego, the, the self-confidence a little bit, but it doesn't crush you like, you know, fire and brimstone and just leave you there. No, the law is good. It has a purpose and, and that is to get you to despair of yourself, but only so that you see Christ and you see that, yes, even you, even you who didn't want to be transformed, you can be whenever you turn to the Lord, whenever by the Spirit's power you contemplate, you see his glory and all that you've, he's done for you. What does it do for a second group of people, people who, who think they're, they're, they're pretty good because They've already been spiritually transformed. What Christ does is he removes the veil and he shows you that all your good works, that they're like filthy rags. All your good works, they, they shine like the moon, which is bright. But when the sun is here, it doesn't even compare. When the sun is here, the moon's light is, is not even bright compared to it. That glory of the law, it passes away. But the sun is here and he shines and he actually shines on you so that you with an unveiled face receive ever increasing glory from the Lord because what you receive from the Lord is not the basis or the merit of your works. You receive the merit of his and what he gives you from his work is love and joy and peace and freedom and forgiveness. You are no longer in bondage to sin and death and the devil and the law which makes its demands. You're free from that. Does it say to the third group? People who think, nah, not me. I can't, I can't be transformed. It's worth highlighting what Paul says. Whenever anyone, it means anyone, turns to the Lord, again, we all, he's talking about everyone. This is so inclusive. We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed. Do not think you cannot experience the personal transformation, transfiguration that Moses and Elijah got to experience and, and Peter, and James and John got to see. No, because of Christ, Christ for you, that transformation is your hope and your reality. You have been set free. You have been set free from whatever it is that made you feel like you can't be transformed. And you are. You are because Christ came for you. And when he came in the flesh, Christ came and kept perfectly all the laws that you couldn't, and he did it for you. God who made the laws kept them perfectly for you. You are set free from death because when Christ Jesus came, he came for you and died. And you have life. You have a glory-filled life with ever-increasing glory because Christ rose for you. On Easter, Christ rose for you. And whenever you see that, whenever you meditate on that, whenever you spend time thinking about that, whenever you contemplate, you see what I'm doing here, don't you? Whenever you spend time looking at and taking in Christ's glory, which is his work for you on the cross and on Easter, transformed.
you are transformed and you are given Christ's glory, which comes from him in ever-increasing measure. That's how you're spiritually transformed. I said my goal was to make it simple. And I don't know if I've done that. So I want to end with a story where this, this really took place. A pastor told the story of a couple who came to him for marriage counseling. And they came for marriage counseling, maybe, but more to kind of let them know. They made their decision. They were going to get a divorce. And so as the pastor listened to this, he, he did what I think any good pastor would do. He said, don't. <laughs> he said, don't do that. Here's why. God has laws. He says, don't, don't get divorced. God has laws. He says, don't get divorced. I, I hate divorce. I've listened to you here, and, and yeah, God makes a few exceptions for divorce, like unfaithfulness, but there's not that here. So you don't have biblical reasons for divorce according to God's word, his law. And the more he spoke, the more the pastor talked to them, he realized it was kind of like talking to a brick wall. Or if we're using the textual analogy, he's talking to veiled faces. And the way the pastor told the story of what happened next, it, it maybe almost seemed like a last-ditch effort. But he thought, you know what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to tell him about Jesus. I'm going to tell him about Jesus, who in Ephesians 5 compares himself to the Father and his relationship to the church, and, and he uses marriage as an illustration. And he talks about himself as the bride in relationship to God, where he humbly serves God and, and, and helps God. And then he told the wife about that Savior who, who died for you, who loves you, and, and you get to be like that in your marriage. And then he, he talked about when in Ephesians 5, Christ compares himself to a husband in his relationship to the church and, and how Christ sacrificed for the church. And he did it, and he did it to make his bride, the church, holy and perfect without stain or blemish or, or any, anything wrong with it. And he looked at the husband and he said, and now your God who, who did that to you, he asked you to be like that in your marriage with, with your wife. You want to know what happened next? Transformation. Two trains that were seemingly headed in different directions changed, were transformed, were transfigured, and, and reconnected because that's what the gospel does. That's what happens when you contemplate Christ and his glory and, and his gospel. It changes hearts and it changes lives. I don't know what it is for you that you want changing or you pray to God for changing. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a specific sin in your life that you just, you just don't want to do anymore and you want transformation there. Maybe it's an area of your life where you know you should be doing what God says is good and, and you, you just don't. And, and you want transformation, transfiguration there. Here's my encouragement to you. First, watch out for, for ministries, for, for words that make you, force you to just look at Moses, to contemplate the law, to spend your time trying to do step one, two, and three in order to achieve your change or your transformation. Because there's a lot of ministries like that. Watch out for them. And here's my second encouragement. Contemplate your Savior. Contemplate Christ's glory. Whenever you gather here together, whenever you go out from here and you, and you group with other Christians, whenever you at home open up your Bible and, and start your day or end your day or right in the middle of your day, grow in God's grace by contemplating Christ's glory that is on page after page of Scripture. 
and be bold. And be bold doing that because maybe, maybe Peter gets thrown under the bus a little bit for, for wanting to keep Moses and Elijah and Christ there. Maybe people goof on him because of his exuberance and maybe I'm defending him because no one's ever accused me of lacking enthusiasm. But, but he was onto something. He wanted it because he saw the goodness that God gives in Christ. And he's jealous of you and I who have it and get to keep it. So by, by the Spirit, who is the Lord, God bless you as you contemplate it. In Jesus' name, amen.